Well, I'm back again, and I'm back this time with someone you have never met. This is a friend from many years, Dr. Fred Farouk, and he is got his doctorate now. And uh, Fred, so good to see you. Good to have you back on board and good for you to introduce your new book. Now, what book are we talking about? Here it is right here. It's called Whatever Happened to Christianity? The, the subtitle is a tafsir for Muslim scholars and thinkers. So, Fred, this has been a good book. I've read through it. I want to ask you some questions about it. And I want also for the people who are listening to get this book. We need to, people to buy it. We need people to engage with it. But let's hold on a minute. The title, Whatever Happened to Christianity at Tafsir? What do you mean by that? What exactly are you saying? Well, hello, Jay. Good to be with you again. And it's uh, always a delight to be a part of what you're doing. Uh, yes, the, well, the background there, you can see that the book kind of has an angle both for Muslims and Christians, but I specifically geared the book to Muslim uh, readers, and I myself were born and raised Muslim, uh, and like many Muslims who learn to pray the Salat or Namaz early in life, I learned this prayer about praying to be kept on the straight path, or as it's said in the Quran, and Muslims will know this, as sarat al-mustaqim. And uh, Muslims pray this prayer, ahdana sarat al-mustaqim, sarat al-ladina, an'amt alayhim, ghayru al-magdubi alayhim wa ladalin, which is from Surah Fatiha. It's part of the, the 17 daily uh, rakat, or 17 daily rounds in the five daily prayers. And uh, this prayer, is that Muslims want to be kept on the straight path and not the path of those who have gone astray. And it's interesting that in the Islamic commentaries and even, even in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, he said that those who have gone astray, Adalin, are the Christians, a Nasara. And so uh, the, the angle, I think, Jay, for your specific uh, audience, because I know you do a lot of material on the origins of Islam, mm -hmm. and I've been uh, a person that's way back from the early days before internet, when you had pamphlets and so, so forth out that were very helpful. Uh, a lot of us uh, in, in th maybe 20, 30 years ago started reading your material and that of others. And uh, that really put a spotlight on the questions that Muslims have to answer regarding the early Islamic history. This book is a little bit different because it also poses questions that Muslims have to answer regarding the early Christian history. And this also is existential to the, the viability of Islam because Islam needs in the standard Islamic narrative for Christians on the Sara to have gone astray. But as you probe into the question, and this is the reason I wrote the book, it seems very difficult for Muslims to, to answer the question, when, where, and how did Christians go astray in their beliefs about Jesus Christ? And that's the reason I wrote the book. Right. Now, let's just back up a bit. You talked about the going astray and this and you said that this is the fatiha for those of you who don't know what he's talking about this is the very first chapter so i've got my quran right here let me just so to understand what you're talking about and what people need to be aware of when you talk about the right the straight path that is actually the fatiha which if you have your quran in front of you that's the very first chapter that's the one they pray every day and that's the most famous one and the, verse six there's only seven verses in this Verse six is guide us to the straight way. Verse seven then talks about like the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace, not of those who have earned your anger, that's the Jews, nor of those who have uh, went astray. That is, that's us Christians. It doesn't say that in the text, Fred. Uh, that's, you have to go to the commentary and the commentators, the exegetes unpack that for you. So this is really an attack against Christians and Jews, how they go astray. That's what you're talking about. So you're put, you're picking up something that most every Muslim will know, not many of our, our hearers will know. And this is the context of the confrontation in the very first chapter about our, that we have gone astray. And you're saying here, 
uh, that the the astray has to do with our scriptures. Is that what I'm getting from you? Well, uh, not only with the scriptures, but the primary question, and if I could back this up, maybe with just a couple of personal anecdotes, I was born and raised Muslim. And as a young man, as a college student, Jay, I went through a period of searching uh, and I was weighing uh, the, 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 I had a chance to read the Bible and uh, I was raised Muslim. So I knew that Muslims always wanted to be on the straight path, as sarat al-mustaqim. But it's interesting as I read through the Gospel of John, and this isn't in the, in the book, but my personal testimony, you know, Jesus, he doesn't pray, show us the straight way or show us the straight path. Jesus himself says, I am the way. So there is a difference here between even the way, uh, say, you know, if you accept that Muhammad dictated this uh, Fatiha, he's showing, he's asking, show us the straight way. But Jesus is saying that I am the way. So you see immediately that there is a differentiation here. And it's not just about corruption of scriptures, although we deal with it at some length in the book, but it's really... Uh, the the challenge, as you mentioned, you see that Islam has a polemical approach toward Christians and Jews. Uh, it says that the, the wrath of Allah rests upon the Jews and that the Christians have gone astray, even though it doesn't say it in, in the very last uh, ayah of Surah Fatiha. So they ask the Prophet for interpretation because the Quran doesn't say, who is who are the ones upon whom the wrath of Allah rests? Uh, and uh, he says, those are the Jews. And they ask him, who has gone astray? And he says, those are the Nasara. The Christians have gone astray. That's in the Quran? Uh, no, that's in the Hadith. That's in the that's Hadith. What I'm yeah, just so and people don't look, don't look for it. It's not there in chapter, uh, verse 7. So that's yeah. that, this is the, the traditions that come much, much, much later to explain yes. it. Okay? Yes. And, and uh, so, so what builds out, and that's very common, where you have kind of some embryonic teaching or uh, maybe vague teaching or uh, incomplete teaching in the Quran. Then they go to the Hadith and the and the, the Prophet, he gives some commentary or some illumination to that. And then later the Mufassirun, the, the commentators talk about this. So we have in this case, we have Tafsir al-Jalalain talks about the those who have gone astray, Adalin. Uh, we have it also in Ibn Kathir. He's, he speaks about this, uh, that it's the Christians that have gone astray. And this really becomes part of the standard Islamic narrative. And that is the standard Islamic narrative. And this is very, very important for Muslims, is that in the standard Islamic narrative, Jesus is only a prophet. And he is a prophet, a messenger of Tawheed, like other prophets in their generation. But the, the question becomes, wow, if you look around, Jesus, uh, in the view of Christians, he never just considered himself only a prophet mm. or only a messenger who would point the way to a prophet who would come after him, Al-Khatim, the final prophet, Ahmed or Muhammad. Uh, Jesus, from the very early Christian history, uh, the time of the, the Bible, the Gospels, the Acts of the Apostles and the early Christian history, the Christians believed that Jesus was the divine son of God that he was uh he came from heaven to earth to die for the sins of people and uh, this becomes something that the muslims have to explain how did christians go astray or whatever happened to christianity how could they have gone astray in their beliefs about jesus because if christians uh, did not go astray in mass about their in their beliefs about jesus then islam is not necessary a final prophet, al Khatim, is not necessary. Jesus, when he says, it is finished on the cross, the plan of salvation is finished. So I believe, uh, Jay, that this question becomes very important uh, for Muslims, just as the other material you're doing about the early Islamic history is important for the viability of Islam. Muslims also have to now contemplate and back up this idea of when, where, and how did Christians go astray in their beliefs about Jesus Christ? 
So there really are two themes that you're talking about, and these are the two themes that most everybody should know that really Islam is attacking us on. One is the person of Jesus Christ, and the other is the his revelation or what they believe is his scripture. We know we know uh, differently. This is with those who have written about what Jesus said or wrote about what Jesus did. That's why, in many respects, uh, much of what we're seeing in the Quran that attacks those two themes are full of errors. And some of them you bring up. Um, the how you talk about when, where, and how may we have gone astray. And you answer that very quickly, saying a lot of these are misinterpretations, a lot of these are misconstruing. And so, in some ways, you're giving it that. So, this is a tafsir. Your tafsir is basically to unpack some of the difficulties, some of the miscommunications, and certainly uh, the misunderstandings and even misappropriation of what we believe. Chapter 5 of the Quran especially is full of error after error after error. Chapter 5 verse 72 suggesting that Jesus is the partner of God. No one believes that Jesus is the partner of God. Or verse 75 that suggests that God cannot eat and therefore Jesus cannot be God. Yet we all know God can eat. That was God eating with Abraham in front of the tent of Mamre. If God cannot eat then I can do something better than God. I'm bigger than God. I'm more able to do something than God cannot do. That's a pretty small God. Or probably the most famous one in chapter 5 would be uh, verse 116 which confuses Mary uh, with in the Trinity. Now there, there are many derivations on the answer to that, but obviously this is our chapter 6 verse 101 which suggests that Mary is the wife of God and God has a God cannot have a consort as if Mary is that consort. No Christian would suggest that. No one ever believed that. Mary not the wife of God at all. Now that's what's fascinating because you're bringing up some you're going you're doing your own tafsir to under, help Muslims understand where not just the Quran gets it wrong but where Muslims today get it wrong. So it's very much a present context that you're bringing it to. I want to go to the second part because mm -hmm. you then go into what you call bridges within the early church. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, can you define bridges for us? Just the time, what is a bridge? And then why have you introduced this material? Why are you going back to the early church in this context? Yes. Uh, well, these are great points, Jay. And uh, just to explain this a little further, um, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing the book as a person that was born and raised Muslim. And so the, the standard Islamic narrative, even if you accept that, it's fairly weak or it's, let's just say, a little bit vulnerable. Because in the standard Islamic narrative, you have one prophet who is writing or really giving dictation in that narrative. He's giving dictation over about 22 years from 610 to 632 AD. And so there's just one prophet. There's no other corroborating really evidence. Uh, there's not other prophets writing it and so forth. So you have one prophet. And, and that's one of the reasons that Muslims, uh, among others, tend to be very sensitive about criticisms of Muhammad. It's not maybe that they're more sensitive than other people. But it's that the whole credibility of the religion rests upon the the veracity of that one prophet now in the new testament what you have is something different and the of course the muslims uh, if they're digging into the bible a little bit they may realize that the new test the new testament is part of the bible we have the old testament 39 books and the new testament 27 books 66 books written over 1500 years by about 40 writing authors or 40 prophets and you can just see uh, uh, someone from outer space looking at that and say well if you have one one writer or one prophet if you will dictator writing over 22 years versus 40 writing over 1500 years which uh, the gravitas of the of these uh, testimonies is going to be much different and if we just take the new testament subset um we have, it, we have eight New Testament writers, the four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we have Paul, uh, James, Peter, and Jude epistle writers. So we have at least eight. And we have, of course, the one book of Hebrews, which the authorship is, it's not been particularly given to one writer. Uh, it, you know, certainly was written by one person, but it's some think it may have been Paul or other writers. But at the very least, we have eight witnesses to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, writing about over 50 years. So again, 
one uh, prophet, Muhammad in the standard Islamic narrative, versus eight writing prophets uh, in the New Testament. And again, you see here that these uh, early disciples, these eight these eight prophets or these eight New Testament writers, we usually use the word New Testament writers, we have three of them are Jesus' disciples, Matthew and John, that's two of the gospel writers, as well as Peter. And then we have two half-brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. We have this, the historian Luke. We have Paul, who is the persecutor who becomes a follower and becomes a leader. Uh, and then also Mark, one of the gospel writers. So we have eight New Testament writers, and they all uh, confirm and they corroborate each other. And uh, it's clear that when Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of the Holy Trinity. That's what the early church did. Thomas, going all the way to India, I believe your ancestral uh, homeland there. Uh, and, you know, so at this very early New Testament period, the generation of the disciples of Jesus, the, the, the gospel message that Jesus Christ was the divine Son of God who died on the cross for people, rose again and ascended to heaven. This spread all the way from India, all throughout the Mediterranean basin, Mesopotamia, up into Europe, even into Africa and Ethiopia. And, um, and the anecdote for me was I started having to teach church history in Albania, which is a historic country uh, where Paul you know, uh, preached. And also it's a, a Muslim majority country. And you know, I started thinking about this, Jay, as I was teaching church history, as, as a former Muslim in a Muslim majority country. And I said, you know, this whole Islamic narrative, it just seems to lack credibility. It almost sounds a little fishy. When, where, and how could Christians have gone astray uh, by committing shirk, by elevating Jesus Christ? Because the Islamic narrative states, you know, that Jesus would have just presented himself to his disciples as a mortal messenger of Tawheed, just a human person who preached Tawheed, Islamic monotheism. And yet they go all over the world preaching a completely different message. It seems hard to explain. And I, I commit this book to, uh, you know, uh, looking at some of the Islamic, uh, you know, suggestions or, you know, the, one of the big ones is that Paul hijacked Christianity. Ahmed Didat, that was his thesis that you know, Jesus was just a Unitarian, a messenger of Tawhid, and Paul hijacked the movement. Well, in the book, in chapter five of the book, in part two, we deal with this. Is this very credible that Paul hijacked Christianity? He was one of eight writers. He didn't write the, a, a gospel. You would have thought if he wanted to hijack Christianity, we would have a gospel according to Paul. Yeah. He doesn't write such a thing. He only writes about a quarter of the New Testament. And though he is a luminary theologian and a luminary missionary, we can't say that Paul really, uh, for example, uh, originated any major doctrine, say, such as the divinity of Jesus, because we see John emphasizing that even more. And, and this is kind of moving into part three of the book. But we look at the Islamic theories that Paul hijacked Christianity. Not very likely, because uh, in their writings, Peter calls him beloved. In the book of Acts at the Jerusalem Council, James calls Barnabas and Paul beloved. Not likely to be words that someone would use regarding someone who is about to hijack your religion and your movement. Uh, and we talk a little bit about Tahrif, the doctrine of corruption. Uh, so the book Before deals with that. that. Before we get into that, yes. let's, I want us to ask you a question about Paul. Um, yes. You can see, I can see why you really zeroed in on Paul, because it comes up in a lot of our of our discussions with Muslims, and a lot of it stems from a number of papers that were written by a Jewish scholar named Chaim Maccabee. I don't know if you've had a chance to read his material, but Chaim Maccabee confronted this notion that Paul was part of the original doctrine. In fact, he was the one that stipulated that it's Paul that introduced the Trinitarian formula. It is Paul that introduced the divinity of Jesus. It's Paul that introduced the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's Paul that introduced this idea of Jesus coming to atone for our sins. All of these major doctrines that we see in the New Testament, he puts on the shoulders of Paul. And of course, the Muslims have grabbed this. They love it. 
because the, without realizing that much of what High Maccabee was saying is completely shut down just by looking at the gospel account. And you can see almost everyone, in fact, every one of these accusations that he gave that Muslims are now mimicking uh, on, the, this, uh, on the suggestion that Paul did this. Jesus said it very much. But why is it they zero in on Paul? And why is High Maccabee zero in on Paul? Because Paul takes what Jesus said and applies it to Ephesus, applies it to Philippi, applies it to Corinth, the different cities. Therefore, he, he is so much more clear in how these are to be used and fleshed out in every one of these contexts. That's why Muslims don't like him, because he is the one that really is the, uh, that confronts the primary doctrines, or you might say that Islam was based on. Islam was based on confronting these very doctrines. If you look and see, all the earliest manuscripts are confronting Jesus' divinity. They're confronting the Trinity. They're confronting his sonship. That's on the inscription of the, of the Dome of the Rock. That's on the coins of the Malik from the very beginning. You see this attack against the divinity and the Trinity, uh, the divinity of Jesus and the Trinity, and also this idea that Jesus was came to earth as God in human form. These are all part of what Islam was really created by. Started with Abd al-Malik in the seventh century, then was really encased in their standard Islamic narrative that you're talking about in the traditions that were all Abbasid in nature. So that's why it's so important that you brought this out in your book. And I'm glad you did. What book are we talking about for those who come in? It's this book here, What Happened, Whatever Happened to Christianity, a Tafsir for Muslim Scholars and Thinkers. Really, you're doing this for all Muslims, but really to think through before you just uh, throw it away. This this is a thinking book. This is an integral book. This is a book that really unpacks many of the co these conversations and many of uh, these de debates that we've had with Muslims concerning the person of Jesus Christ and the authority of Scripture. I'd like to go on to the third part. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's entitled An Inquiry into the Reliability of the Portrayal of the Lord Jesus' Life and Teachings as Represented in the New Testament. So, you go into four of these beliefs, and these are the four cardinal ones. Uh, the, the belief in a personal God, that's huge because that's completely missing in Islam. Belief in the divinity of Jesus, that's what Islam is attacking. And the Trinity, that's what they're attacking. And this idea of salvation by faith, which is diametrically in opposition to how Muslims are saved. Can you kind of unpack? You do a great job in this book of looking at those four cardinal. First of all, why did you choose those four? And then what is it you're trying to say here? I don't want to give a whole summary because I want people to read the book, but just kind of give a summary of why you chose those four. Well, I chose those four, Jay, because those are four of the main doctrines that are uh, un-Islamic or anti-Quranic. And so uh, Islam wouldn't accept any of those doctrines. And the methodology for that section of the book, really, it calls into this idea that, say, maybe Paul created the idea of the Trinity, or he was the only champion of that. And in each of those four doctrines, the methodology was to look at the output of the eight New Testament writers and see if there was corroboration. For example, uh, maybe let's take the divinity of Jesus. Suppose only one writer out of the eight spoke about the divinity of Jesus. Uh, but in fact, we see that in every one of these doctrines, there was broad-based, at least six or seven or eight of the New Testament writers write very clearly uh, and uh, substantively about that particular biblical doctrine. So we see that the what becomes Christian doctrine, uh, for example, the Trinity, well, people might say, well, that's a later, uh, you know, innovation or, you know, uh, this somehow between the life of Jesus and New Testament canonization, these doctrines came in through, who knows, Greek thinking or, uh, or Pauline misguidance. You know, they have various theories and uh, European skeptical or liberal uh, scholars have been pushing uh, some of these doctrines from even the 19th century. But as it, as it affects Muslims, uh, maybe I can just make a comparison because uh, you've brought up a couple points that your readers will or, or your listeners will certainly be familiar with. In Islam, you have the time of the prophets, the prophet uh, of Islam, and then you have this Rashidun Caliphate, the uh, Abu Bakr, 
Omar Uthman and Ali, and that goes for, uh, from about 632 to 661. Then you have this uh, Umayyad period that was uh, centered in Damascus for about a century, and then in 750, the caliphate moves to Iraq, to Baghdad, and then we see a lot of things happening that you're uncovering in this historical period. Well, we do a little bit of a similar uh, evaluation. We look at the life of Jesus, his disciples, the apostles, the New Testament writers, and then who did they disciple? Who did they pass the torch on? Now, they didn't pass it on in terms of having a political empire, but we see, for example, uh, the bridge generations like Clement of Rome, Polycarp, Ignatius, and then even into Irenaeus, that there was a, there was a chain of writing, there was a chain of manuscript transition, transition transmission, and there was also uh, a very strong theological continuity from Jesus, the apostles, and the early church leaders right to canonization, which takes place long, long before even Islam emerges. So, you know, Muslims have this idea, well, Christians went astray. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, the Muslim idea is that the Jews, they believe in God, they believe in Allah, if you will, but they only accept up to Moses, but they fell short by not accepting Jesus. The Christians are a little better because they believe in God. They believe in prophets up to Moses and up to Jesus, but they fell short because they failed to recognize and accept Muhammad as the final prophet. But the Muslims, we accept all prophets and all books. But as actually we look at this, we see that there isn't a con continuity in Islam. We have uh, you know, we have actually a lot of uh, uh, support in the Old Testament for plurality in the Godhead, which is uh, elaborated and really revealed in the New Testament. And in these four doctrines that you mentioned, belief in a personal loving God, uh, the divinity of Jesus, the Holy Trinity, and salvation by faith, which again is not Islamic. Uh, Islam basically holds to salvation by faith and works, but really operationally it's salvation by works these are un-islamic doctrines we didn't have time to go into things like uh uh the theological anthropology what is the nature of people were people born in the state of fitra as islam states basically uh, a state where we wouldn't believe we were not raised as muslims to believe in original sin uh but uh we didn't deal with that one. We didn't deal maybe some with, with some other doctrines like miracles and so forth. But these four doctrines, I think, uh, are important ones because they're all cut against the grain of Islam. And we see that all of those four doctrines, which are central to the biblical faith, are uh, corroborated by many, many of the New Testament writers. Not They're not just Pauline doctrines. They're not just the doctrines of Luke or John, but that all these New Testament writers corroborate. Uh, and, and so this becomes difficult for Muslims if they say, well, all the Christians have gone astray in mass. How exactly did that happen? It, the, the faith spread from, as I said, India to, to Europe, to Spain, to Italy, to Ethiopia in that first generation. And if somebody had gone astray, like a Paul or someone had come in later to misguide or mislead the Christians, then the Indians and the Christians in India would have stood up and said, hey, hey, no, we receive the message of salvation by faith in Jesus and the Trinity. We don't accept uh, Unitarian Tawheed method, you know, message that Islam claims. So that actually provided stability uh, among the Christians and the, and the Bible actually, uh, there's really no, uh, I wasn't able to find any credible uh, evidence that the scriptures have gone astray, uh, the scriptures have been corrupted, that they became muharrafa. Uh, we don't see really strong historical evidence for that at all. Okay. Listen, you you go in and you do bring this theme about going astray, which is from the Fatiha, uh, verse mm -hmm. 7. And you bring and you end off your book kind of reliving or asking this question again. Where really did the Christians go astray? fascinating so you start with this in the very beginning of your book and you come around at the very end to end with it where christians have gone astray if you want to know where we've gone astray here's where we've gone astray help us with this so you are saying that there have been problems 
concerning the, 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 the whole tenure and also the historical context of what we've been dealing with and engaging with. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yes, so this is chapter 10 of the book, and it's a, a short, the book is very short, it's only about 130 pages, so, yeah. uh, you know, you can get it on Kindle, and you, you can read this book between uh, between breakfast and lunch, between Fajr prayer and Duhar prayer, you can read the whole book and oh, read oh, some comments. Yeah, it, it's so packed with material, you'll be underlining a lot of it. I've underlined yeah. places here and there that I thought were gems. So, yes, you can if you just zip through it. But so, make sure that you engage with it and that you actually learn the material. Because Fred has done an amazing job here of really point, pinpointing the two major areas and also some of this misconstruing. But you do talk about it straight. Go ahead. Back to you on this one. Yes, Jay. So, uh, well, first of all, you know, the Bible says we all like sheep have gone astray. So. Uh, I made a few uh, accompanying videos uh, for the uh, for this book, and they're on YouTube under the same name. You can find them there. What we're not saying, for those who might just look at the title, are we saying that Christianity is a better religion than Islam? It's not really about that. Or is are Christians better people than Muslim people? It's not really about that. The tafsir for Muslim scholars and thinkers there, and I think any Muslim, even if they don't have a degree in Islamic theology or anything, you can be a thinker. And, and that is to think about this idea of who is Jesus Christ? Did Christians go astray in their beliefs about Jesus? Because all of the, we have, uh, we have you know, as Christians, we understand that we are sheep that go astray individually. Mm -hmm. We sin, we need salvation, we need forgiveness. But there's no evidence that the the main body of christians from the time of jesus until you know until you know way past the islamic era and even until now uh was majorly diverted that they became a dalin uh there there were attacks against uh, the christian orthodoxy right from the beginning we see gnosticism start to already emerge in the um in the new testament period and john has to confront that we see, uh, you know, Ebionitism, an extreme kind of Jewish legalism that emerges, and they they deal with that. Paul deals with that in Galatians, and the New Testament writers deal with that. Later, we we find the Arian heresy uh, about the time of the Edict Milan, uh, Edict of Milan, and the the kind of legalization of freedom of religion in the Roman Empire. But that's three centuries after uh, the time of Christ that Arian comes forth and says that. Uh, you know, Jesus, there was a time when the sun was not, and he basically makes Jesus out to be a lesser God. But again, most of these heresies that the, the New Testament writers and the later bridge people like Arrhenius, uh, Origen, etc., they confronted these heresies. None of these heresies, though they may be somewhat similar to Islam, like Arianism, it isn't perfectly Islam. So, uh, for example, if, if Arian is saying that Jesus is a lesser God, well, this is polytheism, and Muslims would have to reject Arianism too, because that also is a form of shirk. Mm -hmm. So, we don't even find in these heresies something that Muslims would say, ah, that is the message of Jesus. All they can basically say is, well, the Gospel of Barnabas, which is like 1,500 years later, was the original. But even in the Gospel of Barnabas, Jesus says, I am not the Messiah. So so then you have a, a problem with that from the Islamic point of view. And really, uh, I think one of the questions for Muslims is this issue of transparency. The, the Quran says that it is the eternal book preserved on tablets. So uh, it's, uh, it says, uh, you know, the Quran is Quran al-Majid, and uh, that is the glorious Quran that it's on preserved tablets. So you might be familiar with the word hafiz, those who preserve the Quran or memorize it. The Quran says that it's, it's on eternal tablets. So the problem that Muslims have is that if there's any jot or tittle mistaken, if there's any uh, you know error whatsoever in the transmission or preservation of the Quran, Mm -hmm. then the Quran, which claims it's preserved, then fails the test. And then, then you have a failure of the prophethood of Muhammad if there's any mistake. So in some of the research like Dan Brubaker's and others, you see, well, we don't have a preserved Quran, or at least that is our 
understanding right now. And this is a challenge for Muslims. But the Christians are very quick to say, we don't really believe in uh, Lauhin Mafuz, and we don't believe in some kind of an eternal tablet or mother of the book theory of revelation. And we do concede that there's some scribal errors in manuscripts. So when Muslims say, well, the, the Bible has mistakes, it can't be the word of God. We concede that there's some scribal errors, but we have the multiplicity of manuscripts. And then we have the corroboration of these many New Testament writers I call the eight great witnesses. So uh, you have you don't have any evidence that the major body of Christians ever went astray. I deal a little bit about the Catholic and Orthodox split and a little bit about church politics, mm -hmm. but these are much, much later. These are even way after the origination of Islam. So Muslims couldn't say that, well, it's at that point or it's at Martin Luther or something like that, that Christians went astray. It would have had to happen early. It would have seemed to have happened early. And uh, we haven't had a time to unpack it, but the other Islamic theory that we talk about in the book is when the Quran in chapter 4, Surah Nisa, says in verses 156 through 158, that the Christians might have been misled or become a dalin at the cross. It appeared to them that Jesus died on the cross. And we we have uh, we deal with this. It appeared to them in the Arabic, it's shubi lahum, that it appeared to the Christians that Jesus died on the cross. And even the Islamic commentators are saying that any kind of a substitution at the cross where Allah cast the likeness on another person, be it Judas or Peter or Simon of Cyrene, one is it doesn't make any sense. And two, it completely then aborts any uh, credibility of historic testimony. I get charged, I get arrested robbing a bank and I just say, hey, it was really Jay Smith. My likeness happened to be thrown on him. You couldn't say you married a person, and this is what the Islamic scholars uh, are were speaking of, even from Fakhreddin Razi in the late 11th century, and echoed in Mahmoud Ayyub contemporaneously. This substitution theory that Christians were deceived at the cross, that again has all kinds of ethical problems, and it doesn't seem like a real, uh, you know, credible theory of how Christians could have went astray. And even if even if they went astray. Uh, regarding whether Jesus was crucified or not, you still have these other doctrines like the divinity of Jesus, the Holy Trinity, which uh, are not even covered by this theory that we're calling, uh, it appeared to them, Shubi Halahum. So uh, I end the book, you know, with this kind of conclusion that the, the question is still out there. When, did, when, where, or how did Christians go astray in mass in their beliefs about Jesus Christ? And I'm hoping that Muslims will engage really in this uh, topic. You know, they say, well, I, I actually, uh, Jay, you might be interested. I, I talked to a couple imams and say, would you do a forward for this book? And I went to one who I knew and I had done some doctoral research with this imam, very tolerant guy and very scholarly as well, um, Indian background imam. And I said, you know, would you like to write a forward to this book? It's kind of an interfaith dialogue book. And, um, and he said, well, uh, what's your thesis? And I said, well, we're trying to find out when, where, and how Christians may have gone astray, according to Surah Fatiha, Ahdana Sarat al-Mustaqim, Sarat al-Ladina, Namta alayhim, Gayr al-Magdubi alayhim, Wala Dalin. How did they go astray? And he said, Fred, my understanding, it was Paul. Paul led the, the Christians astray. So this is Ahmed Didat's position, and we covered this in the book. But as as my research showed, it doesn't seem very plausible, these Islamic theories of when, where, how Christians went astray. And if Muslims cannot provide an answer to that question, there's no there's no need for a later religion. There's no need for another final pro, a final prophet starting a new religion. Uh, and so Muslims now, it seems they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. They have an existential question regarding the viability of Islam that dates from the early Christian period to explain. And then they have all of these questions about the viability of Islam and the credibility thereof in the early Islamic period. So a lot of questions to answer, a lot of good give and take. I mean, I'm open to, you know, Muslims making a video or writing a book saying, you know, Fred, we think you're wrong. Uh, we think it's this. And I'm happy to entertain that kind of interaction. Fred, just uh, so to end this up and bring it to a conclusion, um, 
how many times a day do they do they flip the house? 17 times a day. Am I correct? Yes. So seven That's right. times a day, they repeat this. It's only seven verses long, the Fatiha, right at the beginning of the Quran. And this is the last verse, the God is straight. So 17 times they're making this. Now, I have always been told by my Muslim friends that this is the cursing prayer. They're cursing Christians and Jews because of verse seven, because of the fact we don't go on the straight path. We have gone astray, or in the case of the Jews, they have caused God uh, anger. If that is the case, we're being cursed 17 times a day. And Muslims haven't really unpacked it. They just say, you have gone astray. And of course, the comeback is always because of your scriptures and because of what you've done to Jesus, the book and the man. If that is the case, and it's at the very foundations of what Muslims do every day, uh, then you can see why this is a huge question that needs to be asked. Listen, you pray it all the time. You're cursing us every day. That's why, please, Christians, don't do this prayer. I know there's some Christians that are being said to do these seven verses to come alongside and to align themselves with Islam. You're cursing yourself by doing that, so don't. But what you do need to do is ask the very this very great question. Where have we gone astray? It's You're praying it every day. Show us where we've gone astray. And I thought you've done a great job of answering every one of these. You've gone through the major four doctrines. Uh, we haven't gone astray on those four doctrines. You've talked about the Pauline paradigm, <clears throat> that Paul is the one that caused all this problem, which is a real popular comeback whenever Muslims engage with it. You've kind of shut that one down. And then you ask, well, then where, what is this? What are we talking about? What are you praying every day? It's all in this book. It's not very big, 130 pages. I encourage you to buy it. Put it on your put it on your book stand and then read it. It does not take very long. I took a, took a little longer because of the fact that I, there's so much juice in there. There are so many, many good, good gems. But do go ahead and do it. Right down here, you can see at the bottom, I'm putting down the URL. You can get it on Amazon. And uh, here's a picture of it. I'm going to put it right up here. You can see a picture of the cover. So no excuse not to know what we're talking about here. And no excuse not to know who Fred Farouk is. A former Muslim himself. He knows it. He's grown up with it. He had to pray it himself uh, 17 times a day. So he knows exactly from where he speaks. But he has now come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's these very doctrines that Islam is confronting that have brought him through and made him engaging not only as a speaker but as a thinker and now even as a scholar on this subject listen fred so glad to have you on board thanks for this book i hope that everybody does get it and uh, uses it and applies it but engages with muslims and the muslims who are watching it you get it try to find anything wrong with it and then come back on fred now what we're going to do uh, as we put this up there are comments right at the bottom look at the comments down there fred's going to look at the comments you muslims Come back at him. This is called peer review. We want you to engage with him. We want you to engage with what he just said. Then go buy the book and then write down what you don't like about what he said. Give him your email and he'll keep in contact with you. And this way, this discussion and this debate can be ongoing because this is a tafsir for scholars and thinkers. This is a tafsir for Muslim scholars and thinkers. No, some of you are not Muslims. Many of you probably just want to engage at this level on these questions. Do that as well. There are the comments. Please use them. This is why, in some ways, uh, YouTube is such a great vehicle because we can get peer-reviewed and then we can also engage with those who are reading and watching what we're saying. Listen, Fred, thanks so much for coming on board. Thanks so much for introducing this book. Thanks for unpacking it. And of course, the, I wouldn't have you on if I didn't like the book and I didn't like you. You've been a good friend and I, I love the way you think and I love also the way you communicate the way you think so easily so we can understand it. It's been great to have you on board today, Fred. Any last thing you want to say before we uh, end off this episode? Well, thank you, Jay. And yeah, I would just uh, conclude. I, I, I conclude the book with some personal uh, anecdotes and analogies just of Muslim family life. You know, these are these are hard questions. They they require a lot of courage um, for Muslims to uh, think about. You know, uh, you know, because if if Christians haven't gone astray, uh, and again, we invite you, as as Jay said, you know, put in your comments, uh, write a book if you want to refute this. I'm I'm not saying that this was never 
you know, uh, dealt with in past generations. But in our generation, we don't really have any excuses. We have an open marketplace of ideas. You can put your comments in. You can tell us what you think. You can go on a spiritual journey. That was a journey that I went on about 40 years ago when I came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And really, there's no excuse for not making your own conclusions, getting digging into the Bible, finding out if you feel that it you know it is a true book or if it is a book that's you know leading christians astray so i really just want to encourage muslims to be brave and for those uh, maybe you're a christian uh and you want to know you know a little bit more into the world of the way muslims think and the challenges muslims may face you might find this helpful as well so uh, i'm greeting everyone and uh, i'm uh, speaking a blessing in the name of the lord jesus over all your viewers and uh, it's been great to be with you jay thank you fred listen Terrific stuff. Dr. Fred Farouk, Dr. Jay Smith, we're a paradox. Over and out. <laughs>